Well, here we are. We're at White Point Gardens. This is right on the Battery in Charleston, South Carolina, and I'm standing with Eric Lavender, and you are the owner of Charleston Pirate Tours. I love the getup. Thank you. Do you go to the grocery store like this? Absolutely. All right. Yeah, it's funny around this time of year, people are always saying, I love your costume. I tell them, this is my costume. These work clothes. Right. Like, if you see me in Hugo Boss, that's a costume. That's a costume. All right. Well, you look fantastic. Thank you. Thank and you. you definitely look the part. And the reason why we're here at White Point is because it is so significant to Charleston's pirate history. Exactly. So tell me a little bit about why we're standing here. Well, years ago when pirates were captured, in fact, basically between July the 3rd of 1717 to December 10 of 1718, there were 51 pirates hanged in this general vicinity. The other crew that was hanged here was the crew of a man named Richard Worley. Now, Worley was kind of an interesting guy because, well, quite frankly, he only made it to six weeks as a pirate. Yeah. <laughs> Not very long. Yeah, his story's <laughs> kind of funny. He was actually, he and a couple of his buddies were hanging out in a tavern in New York City, and they got a little overserved and decided, hey, let's go be pirates. So they went down to the Hudson River and stole a rowboat. So they're rowing down the Hudson River and deciding they're going to be pirates. Well, they, they captured a ship, and they named their rowboat New York's Revenge. <laughs> so then they named their ship they finally captured, New York's Revenge, wreaking havoc coming down the coast. They ended up here uh, toward the end of this month in 1718. Well, they ended up out here in the harbor thinking they could just grab a ship at sunrise and leave. But what they did not know was the day prior, another pirate named Christopher Moody was here, and he got word he was going to be ambushed at sunrise by the governor and a few ships of volunteers. So, so he got away, and then Worley showed up, and then the rest is, and we say, history. So basically what you're telling me is that a pirate became a pirate because he made it his job to seize other ships that were not his. Exactly. And they were so, thieves. And that was not okay with the law. No. So that's why they were no. tried, and then they were brought here right. to meet their maker. We head down the road to the provost dungeon beneath the old exchange building at East Bay Street and Broad, where these captured pirates would await their fate. Here we are in the dungeon, uh, and now this particular area, this once was where pirates were kept, but it looks very different from that time, is that right? Very, very different, because the current building, the old exchange building, went up in 1771. Mm -hmm. What sat in this spot, though, back in the early 1700s, as early as 1704, and up to the mid-1700s, was part of the city wall, the Half Moon Battery, and the Court of Guard. In fact, they've excavated, and you can see part of the Half Moon Battery. In the earliest days, before the exchange building was here, that's what it looked like. I see. And that is where we kept pirates when we caught them in Charleston. So just because that building is no longer here and it's been replaced with this one does not mean that the ghosts don't still haunt the place. Exactly, because they were kept here and the trials, yeah, as a rule, usually ended with a sentence of hanging. The vivid, gruesome details of hangings back in those days, they would first be brought out and placed in a large wagon. And then they were brought down to this general vicinity. This, this point here was really nothing but an oyster bed and a salt marsh. There was no houses, no trees, nothing was here. And along the edge of the water here is where they would hang these pirates. Now they would bring them down here in wagons. The gibbets, basically the gallows if you will, were constructed along the waterfront at low tide. So this is now, the last thing they saw This would be the last view they had. Now, not a bad way, view. Oh yeah. It's not too bad, <laughs> considering. No consolation, but, however. Exactly. But anyway, they usually would allow them to make a little pit stop at one of the public houses to get them a good stiff drink before they brought them down. Once they brought them down, they would stand them in the back of these little wagons. They had positioned beneath the gibbets. And the noose would be placed around their neck. Now, here's where it gets kind of hard, if you will. They just basically pulled the wagon out from under them. Now, the thing was, the ropes were not that long not nearly long enough for their neck to break. They didn't want it to break. They wanted these men to suffer for their crimes. So oh. they literally would kick and thrash, for all intent purposes, looking like a fish on a hook. Oof. And they would thrash horrible. about convulsing on the lines here until they would succumb and suffocate. It was called back then the marshal's dance, or in some cases, dancing the hip and jig. <laughs> <laughs> well, they would then take their bodies and paint them in pine tar, wrap them tightly in chains, and hoist them back up to the gibbets, and leave them stretched along the waterfront 
basically, as they put it, to be properly sun-dried. Now, the purpose of this was very simple. We were having lots and lots of problems with pirates in our harbor. These pirates would come in here and blockade the harbor and steal. So they figure a string of dead pirates along the waterfront might just be a little deterrent for somebody that shows up thinking they can just grab what they want and get out of here. What a horrible, terrible death. Well, I, and then by the, the, the indignity, if you will, of not giving them a proper burial was very, very upsetting to these pirates because in their, in their, in their world and their belief system was an improper or no burial meant a restless spirit to wander. Which brings us to why this waterfront area is so haunted. They still wander. Do you have ghosts that are uh, traveling throughout the White Point Gardens here, but when they were actually tried over the old provost, mm -hmm. the old building, mm -hmm. their ghosts will still haunt that location mm -hmm. as well. Even though that building has changed, yeah. and even though this whole area has changed, their spirits are still steeped. Yeah. On oh, this yeah. hallowed ground. For Halloween and people who are interested in taking a ghost tour, where can they find out more information? They can check our website. It's charlestonpiratetour.com. And we offer a tour in the evenings where we talk about pirates and their ghosts. We also throw in a few little, uh, some fun, other superstitious things about um, the gullahs and the hoodoo. And Ooh, some of that. we love Practicing superstitious hoodoo. things. And that's Our, always a lot of fun, too. And then great. I've got a couple of personal experiences I've had. I've been at this a little over 11 years, and I, and I kid people all the time, tell them I saw my first ghost when I was probably about 11 years old, and, and I've been chasing them down ever since. And I like doing that stuff. In fact, when I wasn't even old enough to drive when I was a kid, and somebody said, there's a haunted house, I said, great, who's going, who's driving? <laughs> I mean, it's just but you're going to have to pay for a ticket to hear those stories. We'll have all the information on our website, foxcharleston.com. Eric, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. All right. Y'all have a great afternoon. We'll thank you so much. All right. We'll be back after this.